Hi everyone, this is Dr. Jake Pace. And I'm Dr. Samir Moll. This is your Awake Intubation screencast in preparation for the airway day. So to start off, why would you do an awake intubation? So you have a patient in front of you who you've deemed requires a formal airway uh, to be performed, but you've made the determination from doing a thorough assessment that you're not so confident that you'll be able to do direct laryngoscopy if your patient becomes apneic. And further to that, you don't think you'll be able to rescue yourselves with the normal equipment that you would use, whether that be a, a good two-hand BBM technique with, with adjuncts, an LMA, or possibly even rescue yourself with a surgical airway. So you deem this person needs an airway, and you're not so sure that you're going to be able to save yourself if they become apneic. That's the kind of person that Jake and I are advocating would be best served and most safely served by having a wake intubation done. Ultimately, doing a proper awake intubation requires you to have a little bit of time with your patient because this is not a crash airway technique. I repeat, this is not a crash airway technique. So you need a little bit of time with your patient and you also need your patient to be cooperative. Running you through our awake intubation algorithm, uh, the first step that's not on this is calling for help. So depending on your clinical environment, you may be in a location where assistance with anesthesia, ENT, or ICU is available. We would advocate that you're calling for help as soon as you recognize you have a difficult intubation um, on, on your, or a patient with a difficult airway who requires an tracheal intubation on your hands. Um, but there are many scenarios and, and practice locations where assistance is not available and you're the only one who's skilled enough to perform this procedure. Become familiar with the equipment that you have at your local center, whether you're working in a community. Uh, become familiar with what access to help you have in the middle of the night if ENT and anesthesia are potentially in-house or not. And then for any of you going forward who may be working in the transport environment, this is uh, absolutely an airway technique that you need to have in your back pocket and be comfortable with. The first decision you really have to make when considering an awake intubation is whether a patient has a dynamic airway. And in the past, there's been a lot of confusion about what we mean by dynamic versus static airways. It's really not that complicated. What we mean with a static airway is someone who has a fixed predictor of difficulty, whether that's anatomic or physiologic, that is not changing over time. This may be a patient who is morbidly obese, who has some anatomic distortion that's not changing, or who may be physiologically uh, difficult, like a DKA or whose, whose physiology is not rapidly changing. That patient has a static airway that's, that's difficult and requires an awake intubation. On the, on the flip side, a dynamic airway is someone who has a distortion of their airway or physiology that is rapidly changing that's leading to a difficult airway. Examples for this would be a burn patient with rapidly progressing edema, someone who has angioedema or anaphylaxis um, would be a, a, the major considerations here from a dynamic airway perspective. So that's the first branch point in our algorithm when considering an awake intubation. So I'll take you through the right side of this screen, which is what to do if you have a static airway. So again, someone who's got a fixed predictor of difficulty that is not rapidly evolving in front of you. So first of all, to start off, we will take you through these in more detail going forward, but the first step is really full topicalization, and that's a, in combination with an anti as well as dissociative doses of ketamine uh, to get your patient dissociated but still cooperative. If at any time you fail with your full topicalization and subsequent attempts to uh, awake intubate your patient, you're going to reattempt, and now you're absolutely calling for help if that hasn't been done already, uh, and ultimately hopefully do a combined anesthesia ER intubation and go to the left side of this of this chart. If after your full topicalization using a DL, VL, or fiber optic device, you are able to successfully intubate your patient, you'll go to just general post-intubation management with sedation, paralysis, and x-rays, and, and the like. Uh, but if at any point you fail, have a very low threshold at this point to abort, call for help, and then proceed to the left side of your screen, which Jake will take you through now. When managing a dynamically difficult airway requiring awake intubation, you don't have time to perform a full topicalization of their airway. 
That procedure takes 15 to 20 minutes and someone whose airway is rapidly progressing with edema or from a burn perspective, um, you don't have time to perform full topicalization. So what you're gonna do here is administer a dissociative dose of ketamine at one to two milligrams per kilogram and perform modified topicalization where you're essentially giving the patient some amount of anesthetic in their oral pharyngeal um, space but not the full amount that you do in a in a in a in a full awake intubation. If if this step after you do your modified topicalization with a dissociative dose of ketamine leads to a failed airway, you're now proceeding to a rescue RSI where you're going to push a paralytic agent and you're going to have a double setup prepared with with the anticipation that an open crike may be um, the next step for the patient. And we would absolutely advocate if you are doing an awake intubation, whether you have a static or dynamic situation, you are taking the time to mark the cricothyroid membrane because ultimately that will be the final step in your algorithm here. If you are on the modified topicalization side because your airway may potentially change quickly over the next few minutes, have your double setup ready, and this is the patient who's ultimately going to need an open crike to try to palpate uh, the usual structures we would uh, feel for rather than uh, having kind of a more controlled surgical airway, so to speak. There's a final reminder that anytime SAPs drop below 90 in any airway management strategy, you're going to be bagging the patient uh, to achieve SATs greater than 90 and when failing to oxygenate, uh, converting to an open crike. So when would you not do an awake intubation? So like Jake said, both of these techniques, whether you're using a, a, a patient who's got static difficulty or dynamic difficulty, you need time. In the full awake scenario, you need at least 15 to 25 minutes to do this properly from beginning to end once you've got your equipment together. So ultimately you need, you need a patient who's going to be stable for that length of time for your preparation. If your patient is not, this is absolutely not the kind of patient you want to be doing an awake intubation on. You're going to proceed to an RSI with a double setup. Secondly, this is not an, a rescue airway technique. Um, once, you, once you've pushed a paralytic, uh, your patient becomes apneic. That's not the person who you now have five to ten minutes of to, to try to play around with a fiber optic scope or get a view. So ultimately, you, this is a first attempt with your rescue algorithms and devices being the same as what we've talked about before. Lastly, your patients are going to be awake during this, hence the name. You need them to be able to cooperate with you to make this as easy as possible, whether it be stick out their tongue, um, uh, move their jaw forward, uh, cooperate with swallowing when you need to. Uh, ultimately, if your patient is unable to cooperate because they're agitated, uh, because their, their physiology deems them unable to cooperate, Again, that is not the person we want you attempting an awake intubation on. So who are some potential cases where you'd consider an awake intubation? Obese patients in respiratory distress that have predictors of severe anatomic difficulty that would be difficult to perform laryngoscopy, to perform a bag valve mask, or to deploy a supraglock device. Other cases may be physiologic difficulties like diabetic ketoacidosis where a period of apnea would be highly dangerous and, and uh, high potential for deterioration. Burns that are dynamic, that are changing with tissue swelling uh, as another anatomic difficulty that may lead to an awake intubation. And same as, uh, goes for static issues like neck or oral tumors or radiation that may distort the anatomy of the upper airway. So in general, the awake technique we're going to be talking about can be used with a direct or a video laryngoscope, uh, ideally a fiber optic scope if you're comfortable with it and your center has one, and also you can do an awake surgical airway. Ultimately, we advocate that uh, if you're able to and have some practice, a flexible intubating scope makes this the most comfortable for the operator and the patient. Medications that you may need, well, that you will need to facilitate an awake intubation are three, threefold. Local anesthetics, such as lidocaine at 2%, where you're going to need to perform topicalization with, um, with a lollipop. Uh, you may nebulize lidocaine to get that deeper into the airway, into the larynx and glottic structures. Next are anti-sialagogues like, like a pyrolate or atropine and dry oral secretions, which may which will allow for easier intubating conditions 
and then a sedative or an antitussive agent. We prefer ketamine, but you may also consider midazolam or fentanyl. You just got to be careful with the dosing of these medications because they can cause apnea, which is exactly what we're trying to avoid by proceeding down a weak intubation uh, route. Ultimately, with these medications, have your lidocaine out and prepped. Uh, you want to stay within the general confines of what your max doses of lidocaine would uh, would normally be. Uh, we recommend having your nebulized lidocaine uh, out and uh, pre-measured, uh, having your lidocaine lollipops out and ready as well. Um, and then lastly, with your ketamine, have it diluted down to 10 milligrams per mil, uh, just so that you can titrate your ketamine a little bit easier during the procedure. So ultimately, step number one is your patient's going to be awake, so tell them what you're going to be doing. Uh, for the next 10 minutes or so, uh, you're going to have kind of various bits of equipment in their mouth and you're going to be giving them different drugs. Explain the procedure to them so that you can maximize their cooperation. Next, you're going to dry the oral, uh, oral cavity with an anti-sialagog. Um, you want to do this in an adequate amount of time. Um, prior to the attempt at, at intubation. Uh, you want to suction and dry the mouth, uh, which will also help, help with the application of topical anesthetics to the oral mucosa and the posterior pharynx. Um, and then once you've dried the mouth with initially with suction and with using some, some gauze, you've administered your anti um then you can administer your topical lidocaine to your nares and mouth to maximize absorption so it's not getting washed away. Uh, and then kind of different techniques that people use to get the lidocaine down into the glottic structures is uh, potentially spraying with the mucosal atomizer device during inhalation so that the lidocaine is directed towards the cords. Other ways to administer lidocaine is through nebules, uh, where we can give five mils of 2%. Um, the difference here is make sure we want nice, big, large droplets. We're not trying to get this lidocaine deep into the alveoli. We want this lidocaine staying uh, in, the, in the posterior pharynx. So uh, set your oxygen at only about five liters a minute, not the, not the usual to flush or 15 that we're used to. Again, to get large droplets. Next. To help with some element of sedation, you're going to administer an agent like ketamine in low aliquot, low dose aliquots of 10 to 20 milligrams. This is to achieve gentle sedation dissociation, but avoids apnea. Uh, this would be the similar dosing that you use for ketamine in most procedural sedations, um, but just low and, and slow doses to make sure you're not pr producing a state of apnea, which we're trying to avoid. Next, if you're using a fiber optic scope, we highly suggest uh, and advocate that you use some sort of plastic as a conduit when possible. Uh, a nasopharyngeal scope split down the middle will allow you to have a nice, clean, clear plastic conduit to direct your fiber optic scope towards the cords. Um, and you can kind of coat that uh, the outside of that uh, NP airway in some lidocaine so that it's more comfortable for your patient. Um, and there's some good techniques uh, shown in the videos to why we split that down the middle so it's just easier to peel off and, and pass your endotracheal tube after the fact. Um, if you are using an oral technique with a, um, a direct or a video laryngoscope, uh, using an oral block uh, just to give yourself more mouth opening and make it more comfortable to the patient may also make it a little bit easier. Next up, obviously, depends on the equipment that you're, you have at your disposal. If you're using an ambue scope, you're going to insert a preloaded ambue scope into the nasal airway, uh, to the distal tip of the nasal airway. And if you're using a direct or video laryngoscope, you will insert that in, in standard fashion around the oral pharyngeal corner. And then you, often having an assistant, just apply a gentle jaw thrust. Um, or grasping the tongue and helping with protrusion of the tongue may may just lift the structures off the posterior uh, oral pharynx and allow you to visualize the cords in a more adequate way. Utilize the spray as you go technique. Uh, many fiber optic scopes like the Ambu or, or Bronx allow you to have have a separate port where you can spray as you go. So advancing, spraying some lidocaine, waiting a few moments, advancing, spraying 
advancing slowly um, will make this more more comfortable for your patient. Um, if you're using a video laryngoscope or a direct laryngoscope, uh, ideally this, this could be done with uh, the curved long mucosal atomizer devices that are available uh, where you can first start by spraying the tongue, then the back of the tongue, and slowly as you're advancing your DL or VL device, just keeping uh, your lidocaine sprays a few millimeters ahead uh, will facilitate cooperation with your patient. Uh, if you are doing a nasal airway with an ambuascope, once you've intubated the cords, you can peel your pre-split nasal pharyngeal airway out and advance your endotracheal tube. Uh, if you're using a direct or video laryngoscope, once you've got good visualization of the cords um, and you're able to pass a bougie at that point, you can uh, then proceed with full sedation and paralysis of, of your patient. This is a topic that can be confusing at times. Uh, don't uh, be intimidated by the concept of an awake intubation. Take time, digest the algorithm, come with questions in the airway day. Uh, we look forward to the discussion that we have around awake intubations. It can be a challenging topic. Absolutely. So these, these patients, by their definition, are are going to be difficult to intubate. So if you're thinking about an awake intubation, you're already going to be a little bit nervous. This isn't something that we do as commonly as, as the basic RSI, but uh, have this in your armamentarium. If it, for the patients who are difficult, uh, this is the safest way to intubate. Um, so it is, it is a useful technique to learn whether you're, you're using a basic DL or VL or you have uh, access to some fancier fiber optic uh, uh, equipment. Uh, ultimately, we will be going through a bunch of different cases on airway day that we can discuss, and there is no black or white answer on kind of who should potentially get an awake intubation, but please bring all your questions and we're looking forward to some more thoughtful discussion on our airway day. Thank you.